Hi, yeah, like Colin said, um, I'm Katie Seiler Miller. I'm a staff engineer on the front end systems team at Etsy. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't heard of us, um, we're a global online marketplace for unique and handmade goods. And as you might imagine, being an e-commerce website, we are really into images. We care a lot about our images. All of us are here today at this conference because images are so important to today's web. We spend a ton of time thinking about the art direction of our images, so making sure that we choose just the right image to convey the right meaning to our users. We obsess over their performance. We've already had a couple of folks talk to us today about making our um, images more performant and handling multiple, like this new multi-device world that we live in. But the way that we think about our, our images is completely biased by the way that all of us experience the web. So if you're anything like me, then this is probably how you spend most of your day. You know, fancy laptop, extra monitor, keyboard, trackpad, mouse, high-end smartphone. Although I, my desk is nowhere near that clean. <laughs> but what about the people who use and experience the web differently than most of us sitting in this room today? People who are blind and can't see those beautiful images that we chose, or people who are deaf and can't hear the sound in our videos, or people who use assistive technology like screen readers to browse the web. So in order to provide the best experience for everyone who visits our sites, we need to start prioritizing accessibility as much as we do performance and art direction. Our websites, tools, technologies should all be designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. So today I'm gonna to kind of take you through a crash course on accessibility. We'll talk a little bit about why it's important, who it's for, and finally we'll talk some more about how we make our images and our videos more accessible. Um, I'm focusing mainly today on accessibility for websites. So some of the implementation details will be different for other kinds of tech, but um, the principles behind it are all the same. And I also wanna be super clear that accessibility is this like huge thing, and I'm only gonna talk about images and videos. So there's a whole lot more that I hope that you'll go and learn about at the end of this. <clears throat> all right, so why? <laughs> so first, to understand how important accessibility is, we're gonna do a little exercise in empathy. So how many of us wear glasses or contacts? Whoa, that's a lot. Yeah, so nationwide about 60% of the population wears glasses. Um, and congratulations, we are assistive technology users. We have these glasses that allow us to see properly. But we don't think of ourselves as having a, a disability because glasses are such a normal part of our culture. Now, if you take your glasses off, how much of this eye chart can you actually read? I mean, obviously now this isn't like the doctor's office, but if we're in the doctor's office and I take my glasses off, I can't read that giant E on top. <laughs> That's how bad my eyesight is. So put yourself in the shoes of an assistive technology user who's browsing your website and you haven't built it with accessibility in mind. It must be kind of like having somebody just rip the glasses off your face. You know, the technology is there, the tools exist, but if we don't use them, then we're effectively shutting them out from our websites. All right, so now you're probably saying, great, Katie, I get it. I'm an awesome, empathetic, kind, wonderful person, but I have to go back and explain to my boss like why we need to spend money and time on doing this. So let's talk about numbers. I often hear, oh, that's not our audience. Um, our sites don't need to be accessible. But according to the 2012 census, 57 million people, that's 19% of the American population is disabled. Are you sure that's not your audience? Having an accessible website's only gonna be more important over time as our population ages. So between now and 2060, the number of Americans over age 65 is gonna double. Now as people age, the chance that they're gonna have um, an age-related you know, hearing loss or vision loss is gonna go up. So if you wanna be set up for future success, you need to make sure that your site is accessible. And if that still isn't enough justification, if your website isn't accessible, you leave yourself open to lawsuits. So this is the text from the Americans with Disability Act. Um, it says that people with disabilities must have full and equal access to play every part of a place of public accommodation. Um, and I kind of put public accommodation in italics there because when this was written in 1996, obviously the World Wide Web was like still in its infancy, nobody really thought about it. But just last year, the grocery store Winn-Dixie was found guilty of violating the ADA because its website was inaccessible. So the possibility of lawsuits is growing every day. 
Um, and uh, not to mention a lot of European countries have really strict regulations worse than the United States. But when we think about accessibility, I really want all of us to take it one step further and embrace this concept of universal design. So universal design is this idea that when we improve the experience for people with disabilities, we're experiencing, or we're improving the experience for everyone who visits our site. So take buttons, for example. To meet accessibility requirements, we wanna make our buttons big, we wanna use large fonts, high contrast colors. This benefits people with low vision, it's easier to see the button. It benefits pe people with motor disorders, it makes it um, easier for them to move their mouse into the click target area to click it. But it also benefits mobile phone users by having a larger tap target. And if your add to, C, you know, add to cart giant CTA, big, huge, bold button is super easy to find, it's easier for everyone to click it and give you money, which is what we all want, right? <laughs> all right, we know why it's important. Now let's learn about who we do it for. Um, when we talk about accessibility on the web, there's five main impairments that we're thinking about. Visual, so that's um, any impairment that affects sight. Auditory is anything that affects hearing. Uh, motor impairments affect movement of your limbs. Cognitive impairments affect your brain functioning. And finally, vestibular disorders and seizures. Um, vestibular disorders is with problems with your inner ear and your balance. And then seizure, seizures, obviously, like some people have a seizure when they have bright flashing lights in front of them, so we don't wanna do that. But again, because we're talking about images and videos, um, I'm not gonna talk in depth about all of them. We're gonna just look at visual and auditory impairments and learn about those some more. So the stereotypical idea that we have in our head when we think about accessibility is a blind person using a screen reader, but that's really only a small part of the puzzle. There's this whole huge spectrum of different kinds of vis vision loss. So refractive areas, that's people like me um, who need glasses. Um, there's glaucoma, there's cataracts, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. Now, those are words right now, so let's use some more empathy building and see what it's actually like to have a few of these different kinds of impairments. So if you go to this website, don't do it now, um, <laughs> on your phone, simulator.cnow.org, you can give it access to your camera on your phone and it'll actually show you a visualization of what it looks like to see the world as someone with a couple different kinds of impairments. Um, so they have a desktop version, you can give it a Google Map street address. So I use, the, here's the view across the street from the hotel. And here's what that looks like for someone with cataracts. Now this is actually, if I take my glasses off, this is about how well <laughs> I can see. <laughs> um, here's what that view looks like for someone with glaucoma, which is damage to the nerves that connect your eye to your brain. So you can see you've, you lose peripheral vision, it's kind of blurry, the contrast has been turned up. And finally, here's what it looks like with retinopathy. So retinopathy is damage to the retina in the back of your eye. It's usually caused by diabetes. All right, so what kind of assistive technology exists to help people who have vision disorders to um, access the web? Screen readers, obviously, is the big one that most people have heard of. JAWS is the most popular than NVDA. VoiceOver is on Mac and iOS, so you can actually turn it on on your own laptop and try it out. Um, and TalkBack is for Android. But again, we don't really, hearing it is not the same as actually experiencing it. So here's a video of what it's like to use a screen reader. So um, this is gonna be really, really fast, and this is usually how fast people who use them um, and have a lot of experience actually play it at. Open Etsy HTML content link. Etsy logo. Search for items or shops. Search for items or shops. Search text field. Search button. Internal link. Skip to intent link. Sell on Etsy. Register button. Sign in button link. Cart. Menu bar items. Clothing and accessories. Jewelry. It's like fast, huh? Tools. Weddings. Mm -hmm. Entertainment. Home and living. Kids so you can see they're Vigil. tabbing and through and the interface. About. And you whenever the, you about. focus about. on an Vigil. element, it, Vigil. the Vigil. screen reader is announcing what the element is. Or if it's a paragraph, it's reading it out. Within our markets, millions of people around the world connect both online and offline to make. Okay. That's enough of that. <laughs> Some other kinds of assistive technology that people with vision loss use are screen magnifiers. Um, they also use um, dictation and speech recognition software like Dragon Naturally Speaking. And they can use a braille display, which is a little box that has dots that pop up to simulate braille. Um, but those are really, really expensive. It's like three to $5,000 for one of those. And also not a lot of people who are blind read braille. Um, you know, you need to think about if you have like 
age-related vision loss, you probably aren't learning Braille when you're an older person. All right, auditory impairments. Again, we're talking about a really wide spectrum. Um, people can be hard of hearing, which refers to mild or moderate hearing loss, all the way through to profoundly deaf, which means they've had full hearing loss. And it's important to remember that not everyone who's deaf speaks sign language. So for assistive technology, people with hearing loss use captioning and transcription of spoken language into um, printed text. So we're gonna get into that with videos in a little bit more. Um, they could also use a captioned telephone service, or increasingly, they're using what's called a video relay service, which is a sign language interpreter sits in between a hearing person and a person without hearing and um, translates into sign language over a video screen connection. All right, <clears throat> so you get why it's important. We know that um, we want to improve the experience for everyone. Now, how do we go and do that? So some techniques we can use are, um, first we'll talk, oh, sorry, first we'll talk about what standards and guidelines exist to help us. Then we'll talk about some tools for making our markup accessible. Then we'll dive deep into images, and then we'll talk about color, and finally videos. So what standards exist? Um, in the United States, there's two main standards. The first is Section 508, which applies to federal agencies, government contractors, and a lot of colleges and universities who accept federal money for research funding. Um, but it was written in 1998, and it hasn't been updated since then. And I think maybe things have changed a little bit since 1998, I don't know about you, but. Um, so kind of the gold standard now is what's called WCAG or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They were started in 2008 and they're continually updated by the W3C. Um, so WCAG provides a bunch of guidelines and then different su success criteria to meet different levels of compliance. So there's A, AA, and AAA. Um, and when it comes to auditory and visual imagery, Really, the main success criteria that we want to follow is to provide alternative ways to access the information in all of our visual and auditory content. And we'll talk some more about how we do that. All right, next is markup. Um, really, if you want to have an accessible application, it all begins with writing semantic HTML. So assistive technology understands semantic elements. It knows how to handle them. And then it knows what to tell an, access, an assistive technology user when it's explaining you know, the interface to them. Um, but if we run into cases where markup isn't enough, we have what's called ARIA, or access, Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Try saying that 10 times fast. Um, which is additional attributes that we can add to our markup that's going to tell assist, like, assistive technology, here's the uh, semantics of how this works. So you can define roles, states, and properties, um, and we'll get into that some more. And finally, um, a super useful thing to have in your accessibility tool belt is this screen reader only utility class. So a lot of times we have a case where maybe there um, there's a form field on screen that doesn't have label text that um, a screen reader can read. And we want to provide the, the label text without having it appear to sighted users. If you use display none or visibility hidden, that also hides it from the screen reader. So um, this screen reader only class is a way to visually hide things but leave them in the DOM in such a way that um, a screen reader can still find it and read it out. All right, images, image con. <laughs> So if you take one thing away from this talk, I hope it's this. Every single image on your website must have an alt attribute, even if it's blank. All right, why is that important? So to show you what happens if you include no alt attribute whatsoever on your image, um, I went in and modified the HTML on this is our favorites page, um, and I removed the alt text, and you can see the up top there, the image has like a auto-generated random character URL and file path. So this is what happens. Control, your recently viewed listings by Katie on Etsy window. Favorite favorite slash you underline three four zero x two seven zero point eight six eight seven nine four one seven one underline four two WP dot JPEG question version equals zero our solar system map planets in That's awful. <laughs> so again, even if you add an empty alt attribute, it's better than nothing because just having the word the, or the attribute alt in the markup the screen reader will either read something or it'll skip right over it. So doing that is better than what we just heard, right? <laughs> so who's gonna go home and add the alt attribute? Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, when we're looking at images though and we wanna actually provide a description for an image, 
the first thing that we need to do is um, ask ourselves this question, like what's the purpose of this image? Is it decorative, is it functional, or is it informative? So we'll start with the easiest type, decorative. So decorative images don't provide any additional information to the page, and they function purely as visual decoration. So if you can remove the image entirely and the meaning of the page doesn't change, then it's decorative. That's usually things like background images, spacer images, header hero images. You can see this example, like these little icons for each of these um, description sections. It's decorative. So decorative images, we wanna always hide them from screen readers because it doesn't provide any useful information. So if we wanna hide decorative images, we have um, a couple different ways to do that. The one we just talked about, add an empty alt text, make sure there's no spaces in, the, in between the quotes there. Screen reader will skip right over it. Um, if we're uh, dealing with like a big hero image, we could also use a CSS background image, so the screen reader will skip right over that. And finally, if we're using inline SVGs for illustrations, um, SVGs don't have an alt attribute, so you use this aria hidden equals true. All right, now moving on to functional images. So these are images that initiate an action if the user clicks on them or um, taps on them. So some examples um, from the Etsy website, and basically if it's inside a button or a link or any other kind of an interactive element, then it's probably a functional image. And functional images, we wanna make sure that we always include text that describes the action that's gonna happen when you click on the image and not the image itself. So for example, um, we have this little search button with the word search next to it and then a magnifying glass. Um, this actually is the easiest solution because the text already exists. So we can just hide the magnifying glass completely because um, if we you know, said alt equals search, then the screen reader is gonna read out button, search, search, and we don't want that. Um, again, in the same sort of case, if we have an SVG, then we just wanna use aria hidden equals true. All right, but what if your functional image doesn't have accompanying text? Um, remember, so this is the Etsy logo on mobile that we just have the E, and this links over to the home page. So um, if we're using an image, it's super easy. We just add alt text, and because we're describing the action, we call it Etsy home. Um, if another way that we could do it is, like for example, if we were using an SVG, is we could hide the SVG using aria hidden, and then we can use this aria label that's gonna provide a name for the screen reader to read out. Or um, we can use our handy dandy screen reader only class to provide um, a span that gets hidden from sighted users and is still available to the screen reader. So which of these options you choose really depends on your situation. Um, there's like a million different ways to do it. And so we need to talk a little bit about icon fonts. <laughs> so I know that they're not awesome and the general wisdom now is to get rid of them, but you know, in case you still have them lingering, let's learn how to handle them correctly because this is another kind of bad experience for screen readers. Um, so this is usually how they work. You have an icon class that sets the font family and then usually you apply a CSS class that adds a content pseudo element that has the Unicode character glyph for whatever that icon is. So what happens when we read out this link to go home? It actually says link go home white right pointing pointer because that's the official like Unicode character glyph long name. That's not a great experience. Um, <laughs> it's generally safer if you ever use an icon font, always hide it um, until you can put the time into switching it out for an SVG, which is a better solution. <laughs> All right. Informative images, now these ones are the hardest because you actually do have to describe them. Um, these are images that provide information that's important for a user to understand the content, the content and the meaning of the page. But if all of that information is provided in the surrounding text, then it's probably actually decorative still, so it's a little bit of a judgment call. Um, usually having something is better than nothing in these cases. And you should always, always, always provide a text alternative for informative images to screen readers. Now this has additional benefits, it's not just screen readers, but um, you know, as Ryan was saying earlier, as you're waiting for your images to download on a slow connection, the browser is gonna display the alt text to users, so it benefits people on slow connections, um, or if you have images disabled, and then also um, Google and other search engines crawl the alt text, so it's good for SEO. So here's some examples of informative images from Etsy. 
This one I really like, it's from one of our seller's bios and it, the, the um, caption is, here's a picture of myself and my 16 year old cat assistant, Mr. Pounce. He likes to manage my time. <laughs> and then um, a chart. So charts are like big complicated visual things that we have to make sure that people with screen readers can actually access. All right, so if you have a very simple description, again, you can use our old friend alt text. More complex decision or descriptions, you can use what's called the long desk attribute. So the long desk attribute allows you to point to a longer description. So what you do is you provide a shorter alt text that the screen reader will read and then it will announce that a longer description is available and the user can decide whether they wanna go and read that longer description or not. Um, so you can either have a, a div that lives in the markup that's hidden that it will point to or you can have a separate um, HTML page or something that you point out off to. But I think honestly for things like this, um, having an, a longer description that's available to everyone, like have a, a link next to an image that says open for long description and having it pop up in a, in a modal or something, you know, that's the way to make it so this is good for everybody. All right, when it comes to long descriptions for SVGs, it's kind of a pain in the butt. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a big fan of this. There's, a, there's some weirdness. You'd think that just having the title and the description in there would be enough, but it's not. You have to use ARIA labeled by um, and point to unique IDs on your title and your description. Or you can use ARIA described by to do that same thing that long desk did where you point to another element on the page that's been hidden. But that's kind of meh. <laughs> So really, again, thinking about universal design and accessibility, um, you know, remember that example of the woman and her cat, Mr. Pounce, like if we hadn't used a figure element to display that caption, then none of us would have known that Mr. Pounce was so awesome. Um, but, you know, the only thing to note about this is you just have to make sure that the image has alt text and a fig caption, and then the screen reader can handle it properly. All right, charts and graphs in SVG, there's actually really great techniques out there to embed text inside of your SVGs, but it's really hard and it's complicated, so just go to this URL if you're interested. <laughs> um, the easy sort of fallback for that is um, if you have like a really complex chart, you can hide the SVG entirely from screen readers and just have the data in its original tabular format available to screen readers, or even better, again, have a little button that anyone can click that will show them the tabular data instead of the chart. All right, how do I write a good image description? It's not as hard as you think. <laughs> um, first, don't, don't use the words image, picture, graphic, or icon. This is redundant. The screen reader is gonna announce that it's an image. You don't need that. What we wanna do is describe what the image is conveying. Like, what's the meaning of it? What's the content? the functionality, the purpose. So imagine you're on the phone and you're describing to like your mom this image. How would you do that to her? Um, also, it's important to know that context matters. So you could use the same image in two different contexts and it would get a different description. And also I mentioned earlier that alt text is good for SEO, but please, for the love of God, do not keyword stuff your alt text. <laughs> Keep the alt text short. You know, again, the guideline is that you want it to be about approximately tweet length. And finally, um, another don't for images is please don't embed text in your images. So um, I mentioned zoom text is a, a way for low sighted users to zoom in super close on the page. So when you think about it, if there's text on the page in a bitmap, when you zoom in on it, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see this like pixelated anti-aliased weird thing, a blob, it's just bad. Plus we have all these modern tech CSS techniques available to us that we can just position the text. We don't need to do it. But if you're gonna use CSS to put text over an image, then make sure that, um, that the contrast is high enough because you don't wanna end up like us. I'm throwing myself under the bus here. <laughs> I don't know how many of you can actually read the text that's overlaid on this image, but this is bad. Um, I don't know if the person who designed the website today is here, but you did a great job. Um, that big blue block behind the text actually makes it legible when it's overlaid over the image. So that's one technique that we can use. <laughs> All right, this leads us nicely into color. Um, so uh, let's do a quick crash course on how human beings perceive color. So, in our retinas, we have two different types of light sensitive cells. We have rods, which work in low light, and then we have cones that work in daylight. And they, um, there are three different types of cones that detect red 
blue and green light. Um, so when someone has a deficiency in one of those cones, or maybe the cones don't exist at all, if you think about in Photoshop and you're trying to choose a color picker, what if R or G was always at zero? It's gonna reduce the, this full set of colors that you can create. So red-green is the most common kind of color blindness, and then blue-yellow and complete color blindness is totally rare. Um, and color blindness affects about 8% of men. There's, I'm guessing there's probably a few men in here today who are colorblind. Um, and you know, I love empathy, so we're gonna have some empathy for people with color blindness. My colleague Jake Voitko made this Twitter bot that you can send an image to, and it will respond with a version that approximates how he sees it. He has protonopia, where all of the red cones are gone. So you can see this, um, it's like a rainbow colored kite. On the right is what he sees, like it's all green, yellow, and blue, there's no reds whatsoever. So what does this have to do with color on the web? So this is a photo Jake took of the restroom doors at his old offices when he worked at Google. So the red door on the left is women's room and the green door on the right is the men's room. And this is what that looks like to Jake. <laughs> They both look the same, right? <laughs> now, thankfully, though, I don't know if you can tell in the lower right corner, um, there's a little sign there that uses information that's available to everyone, which he could look at to make sure that he's going into the right door. Um, this is similar to how we would handle it on the web. So we don't use color alone to convey information. So um, instead of indicating success or failure with just the colors red or green, Add another indicator, either text or visuals, to supplement those colors. So use red text with a red X, or use green text with a green check mark. This makes it clearer for everybody. All right, video. <clears throat> so there's three ways, mainly, that we can make our videos accessible, captions, transcripts, and audio descriptions. So captions we'll look at first. So closed captioning, everyone's probably experienced this. You've seen it, it's when there's text that represents all the audio and like the spoken dialogue and the background noise of a video. It's overlaid over the screen, kind of like sad, <laughs> sad R2. <laughs> um, so how do we add captions? Well, if you're having a live event like this, consider hiring a live transcriptionist or a sign language interpreter. Um, the benefit of having a live transcriptionist is that they're gonna transcribe everything that everyone is saying, it'll appear on a screen, and then you can take that text and pop it back into your video whenever you publish it to YouTube and your transcripts are done. So next year, Sanjay, right? <laughs> um, you can either pay for a professional to write captions for you, or there's a couple of DIY tools you can use on amara.org or YouTube. Um, but be really careful because YouTube's auto-captioning feature um, is notoriously buggy, so you should always have a human look over and review your captions and your transcripts before you push them out. So technically, how do we do this? It's the HTML5 video tag actually includes this track information that we can use to point off to a special formatted VTT file for captions. Um, this is what a VTT file looks like. So you can see it has a timestamp, it has alignment, so it'll say, you know, I wanna have it in the middle of the screen or in the upper left and how wide, and then it shows you the text. Um, and also you have to make sure to include in parentheses like that any kind of like nonverbal cues like sad R2 beeping or other sound effects. Transcripts. So transcripts are pretty much the same as captions, but they include a bunch of additional information because it's just a blob of text. It's not actually overlaid on the screen at the time. So you need to add in things like character names or speaker names, descriptions of the action. If there's any text that appears, transcribe that and include it in the transcript and any kind of like visual only information. So transcripts can either be embedded directly in the page or you can link out to them separately. And there isn't like really a set format for transcripts unless you're gonna upload to YouTube, which uses this format. So this is a imagined conversation between me and Martin about how much we love unicorns. <laughs> so you can see I, I transcribe some of the action. We give each other a high five, then some music plays. <laughs> All right, audio descriptions. So um, most of you probably haven't experienced these, but they're super cool. So in an audio description, a narrator describes what's happening on screen during breaks in the audio. And I have this really super awesome example. It's the 
Hundreds of animals gather at the bottom of Pride Rock, a tall, flat ledge that towers over the rest of the savanna. Zazu, a small blue bird with a large beak, flaps to the ledge. He bows to Mufasa, a powerful, dignified lion with a thick red mane. <laughs> That's pretty cool, huh? You can actually go to movie theaters um, and you can l get a special device that will allow you to hear that audio track in live movies. Um, it's super cool. My mom is actually legally blind, so I have seen an audio described movie in the theater and it's really fun. All right, so those, that actually, those are like insanely high quality audio descriptions. They don't all need to be like that. Basically, um, if you have visual content that's present in the video, um, or as, yeah, if, like as a spoken text, then you don't need to add these descriptions. It's only if you have a lot of information that's only happening visually that you need to add a description. And these descriptive text, there's not super awesome support for them yet, so generally the best thing to do is to make a separate video that you upload to YouTube. Um, or Final Cut can actually outport or export a track that if people have a Mac or an iOS device that they'll hear it, but again, that's not everybody. So just including it separately is usually the best. So this might seem like a lot of work to get captions and transcripts and descriptions for all your videos, but this benefits everybody. Studies have shown that captions improve comprehension and retention rates for even hearing users. Um, if you have non-native speakers who are watching a video, it's easier for them to understand with captions. Think about that statistic that Eric gave us earlier about how 84% of people watch videos with the sound off. If they had captions, then they would still be hearing or getting the, the sound information. Um, caption videos also have higher completion rates and um, transcripts that are embedded in your own site are searchable and actually improve your SEO. So it's worth the extra effort to be accessible. All right, what next? That was a lot. <laughs> Accessibility is a lot. It can feel super overwhelming. So what, what you should do when you get back to work is super simple, pop open Chrome DevTools and run a lighthouse audit of your site and make sure that you check off the little box that says accessibility. It's gonna run an audit and it'll spit out a bunch of things that you can do to fix it. Um, if you wanna go to the next level, Axe is an open source browser extension and it's also a command line interface and it does CI test integration. So you can um, install that in your browser and you can get a report for your um, website. Or if you have folks on your team who maybe aren't super like command line savvy, this Kuali is an open source desktop app that you can install and you just point it to a URL and it'll spit out a report. So we wanna start with our semantic HTML that our screen readers can understand. Again, if you take one thing away, make sure that every image has an alt attribute on it. We wanna add captions, transcripts, and audio descriptions to our videos. And I really want all of us to care as much about the accessibility of our image as we care about their performance. No more excuses that we don't have time or resources. And if you wanna learn more, you're in a great position. Um, accessibility for Everyone is a book by Laura Kalbag. It's by A Book Apart, it's super easy to read. I highly recommend it. Um, there's this Ally Bay, Bay Area Accessibility and Inclusive Design Meetup, which is super awesome. Um, the guy Jenison that runs it, he works at LinkedIn. He's a really cool human, you should go. Um, we just missed it, it was a couple weeks ago, but there's the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference in San Diego every year. I got to go three years ago. Um, you've never experienced being in a building with 5,000 people, the majority of whom are disabled. Like, that changes your entire outlook on life. So I, I think everyone should go to that conference. And then finally, there's a Ally Slack channel that you can join. Um, I mostly just lurk there, because too many Slacks. <laughs> and thank you. Um, if you go to my website, I have, this will redirect you to a page on GitHub with a whole bunch of links and things that I mentioned and talked about. And feel free to hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Kay Seiler. Thank you. <laughs>